Good morning. How are you? Hey, uh, I, I may not have this right, but I would bet that there's a couple in this room that are insecure. And I'm the first in line. Because there is something within me that I just oftentimes wonder, God, do you really love me? Every morning I wake up and I look at Jane and I say, do you really love me? Because there's something in us that we need to be reminded how much God loves us. And through that, God wants to love one another through us. That's the whole meaning of this text in 1 John 4. One of my favorite uh, musicals. Raise your hand if you like musicals. Okay. Raise your hand if you like La La Land. I will make no comment on that. But one of my favorites was Fiddler on the Roof. If you haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof, some of you young guys, go rent it. It is awesome. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is Tevya, is the main character, the dad, is talking to uh, Golda, his wife. And he says, Golda, do you love me? And Golda says, do I what? And Tevya says, do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out, go inside, go lay down. Maybe it's indigestion. But Golda, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know, but do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Gold, the first time I met you was on our wedding night. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love one another. And now I'm asking Gold, do you love me? I'm your wife, I know, but do you love me? Do I love him? For 25 years, I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years, my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? Then you love me? I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. Oh. But then they both said, it doesn't change a thing. But even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know. So maybe today, there may be some in this room, possibly a number in this room, that today you need to be told how much God loves you. That's the whole message in 1 John 4. It's not only does God love us, but if he does love us, then what is the repercussions of that? What are the benefits of knowing God's love? And he starts with a warning that you have to be careful for counterfeit gospels. This is a warning that he gives in the beginning of the chapter in verse 1. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ 
has come in the flesh is from God. This is really important because of what they were facing in this day and age. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is a spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So what John was saying to the audience in 90 AD is the same thing that God is saying to us, that in the world today there are a lot of Antichrist spirits that are teaching us things to lead us astray. And so we have to know what the gospel really is because there are so many misconceptions and there are so many messages out there that are intended by the enemy, the spirit of the Antichrist, to lead us astray. And the big fallout with this movement, which later became known as the Gnostic movement, was that they believed that in this world there is a physical realm that isn't real, but the real world is in the spiritual realm. And so they didn't adhere to the understanding and belief that Jesus was actually God who became, as the scripture said, flesh. He became man. And he came for the purpose of giving his life on the cross for you and I so that we could have a relationship based on love, not rules, not rituals, but on love. And so the testing of the spirits is important because it's it's fascinating what I've seen over the years that I've been a pastor, which is a long time, is that there are many people that have a, shall we say, a cognitive understanding and belief who Jesus is, but they really don't know his love. It's all up here. And what God wants to do is bring it down here to the heart that we know and experience the love of God for each of us. Jesus actually made a distinction. This is really fascinating. As he's speaking to a couple of demons. In Matthew 8, verse 28, it says, And when he came to the other side, meaning the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us? Listen to this. O son of God. So the demons acknowledged who Jesus was. That's fascinating, isn't it? And he said, Have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew what the end was going to be. They knew that they had lost the war already but they didn't know Jesus as their Lord. See, many of us know of Jesus, but we haven't submitted to his lordship in our life. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is what? Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit fills us with his love, our response to him should be allowing his reign and rule in our lives because he becomes the Lord of our lives. Not Kirk being the Lord of Kirk's life. But I lay it down in order for God to be the Lord of everything I do and everything I say. That is what happens when we respond to God's love. It totally changes everything, like I said. There's a a very interesting teaching that is very prevalent in our culture today, and it's called universalism. And what universalism says is God loves man so much that he died on the cross for us, which is true. But they also believe that God, being a loving God, could not produce something called hell. And so what Jesus did on the cross is universally for everyone 
So it doesn't need a response from us. We're just all good with God. That when we die, if we haven't responded to God's love yet, he gives us another chance when we're in something like purgatory or something. And so this, this teaching makes it very easy for us to just go on and live our lives the way we want to live it versus submitting to the lordship of Christ in our life. Because the power of God's love and his truth is he gives us the ability to overcome these false teachings that he calls the spirit of the Antichrist. In verse 4, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So what he's saying here is we have to know the truth. We have to understand the full depth of the gospel because that understanding and knowledge and experience in his kingdom through the Holy Spirit and his love what it does is it helps us to withstand the false teachings of the culture. And I just got to say, as time goes on, it's going to get more and more definite, a distinct difference of two polarized sides, of those who follow the Lordship of Christ and those who are in the world. He says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Spirit of truth is the good news of the gospel. The spirit of error is the spirit of the Antichrist. To lead us away from who Jesus really is. So this false teachings that came, what they said is because God wasn't born fully human and fully God through coming in form of Jesus, that he was merely a spirit or maybe something that he revealed to us in spirit, but he really didn't die physically. We have to understand that he had to become man. And he had to give his life on the cross because the penalty had to be paid. That is God's love. Is That's what motivated him to come and go to the cross, was his love for you and love for me. Without that, the gospel becomes watered down. And so we respond to God in loving him back because of how he loved us so much. And that's why we're not afraid. We're not afraid of what comes in the end, which is God's judgment. And the reason we're not afraid is because we know God paid the price. He makes us perfect and sinless and righteous in the Father's eyes because of what he did for us. Not because we're some kind of righteous dudes. Because we know we're not, right? So we have to know this truth. And then, he says, when you know God's love, you know God more. Knowing God through love. In verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son, Jesus, into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So the beauty of and the amazing reality of the gospel that just blows my mind every time is to know that God initiated. He came to us while we were yet 
in rebellion to him. I was not looking for God when I found him. He reached down and plucked me out of the darkness. I got to tell you, I was surprised. I was totally caught off guard. But what drew me to Jesus was when he finally opened my eyes to see how much he loves me. That's why he died for me on the cross. Blew my mind. And as I gave my life back to Christ, he continues to fill me with his love. It grows. It deepens. And I got to tell you, the older I get, the more I look forward to the end. And that's what hope is. And if we know God's love and we live in that love, what happens is he begins to reveal himself to us through one another. That's why we need the church. That's why we need community. Is the, the amazing thing of the kingdom of God is we find God, yes, in solitude, through prayer, through reading the scriptures. God speaks to us. But there's a big part of the kingdom that we miss out on if we aren't in community because you're missing out on God revealing a part of his love to us through one another. And you rob little old me of that because God wants to love me through you. That's when we become the church. And as, as Jesus said in John 17, he said, the world will know you through how they love one another. That's why he said, Lord, make them one in love. In verse 7, it said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So that's the one thing that we have to really embrace is when God touches us through his Holy Spirit and we grow in the experience of that love, it just naturally overflows into the relationships that we have. And that's what God desires. But here's what happens what I've seen over and over again is when we don't understand this basic foundational truth of the gospel, we buy into a false gospel that says God will show you his love for you by how your life will prosper. God will answer all your prayers when you give your life to him. And so we base God's love, we come to the conclusion of how much God loves us based on our consequences, based on our circumstances. And so if God loves us, my 401K is going to continue to grow. If God loves us, my spouse that left me will come home. If God loves us, my mother's cancer will go away. See, what we don't really understand is the reality of we live in a world of a clash of kingdoms. It, yes, Jesus came and he says the kingdom of God has come. He says the kingdom of God is at hand and it's in you. Yes, that's true, but he hasn't come in fullness yet of establishing his kingdom in the perfect fullness yet, but it will happen when he returns. So we live in this, this tension of stuff happens. People we love die. People we love leave us. People we love abuse us. And then we come to the conclusion, where is God? And we write him off because that's a false gospel. It's a teaching that will eventually get you and take you out. It's interesting that you consider this day that John wrote this letter, 90 AD, they believe. This was the time during the Roman rule of the Roman Empire. The dude's name was Domitian. And they said he was really not a good Caesar. He was filled with evil, with hate. And it said that 
he was inclined to cruelty that raised up, they called it the second persecution of the church. This was a second wave of persecution after Nero. And so he commanded Domitian that the lineage of David would all be eliminated, meaning round up all the Jews and kill them, which would include anyone who would follow Jesus who was a Jew. Okay? So in the midst of that darkness, the audience to John's letter, they had loved ones that were arrested and were burned on the cross. They had relatives that were arrested and they never saw again. They were living in abject poverty because of the persecution against anyone who was a follower of Jesus. John himself, church historians say, was arrested by Domitian. He was boiled in oil and then he was sent to be in exile on a little rock in the Mediterranean called Patmos until he died. John, that has suffered to this degree, he's writing to the church, God loves you. But it's in the midst of incredible darkness and hardship. And how did he know God loved him? Because of what Jesus did. He knew Jesus. He saw Jesus go on the cross. He saw Jesus buried in the grave, and he witnessed the risen Lord three days later. You see, that is where he found his hope, and that is where he experienced God's love. And it wasn't determined on how nice people were to him while he lived on this earth. He was looking forward to eternity. He knew this was not not all there is. He knew there was something better coming over the horizon, and that's what he was saying is, that's how much God loves you, because that's what he has for you. And so he says, we see God through love. In verse 12, it says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So here he goes, he's talking about community that through community, we love one another and we see more of God. And he says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So the spirit dwells within us, but it's not just for us. He gives us himself to give to one another. And he says, and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. So whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and abides in him, there's that abiding word, and he in God is we become one with God through faith. And then as he dwells within us, he gives us the desire to love him back. And he says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So you want to see God grow in your life? You want to experience more of God's love? Receive it and then give it away. In relationships, in community, that's how we grow to experience God more in our life. That's why we need community, man. I just got to say that over and over. And the Holy Spirit just grows to love us more. Solo Christianity is not prescribed in the Bible. I'm sorry to bust your bubble. But what God calls us to is the church, into community. And that's how he wants to love you more, through one another. It's the beauty of community. I I just love hearing stories of, what people have done that is just a demonstration of God's love within them. It's stuff that they just do spontaneously. They don't have to think about it. They don't go, well, let me pray about that, and I'll get back with you. It's just they respond because God's love is already in their heart. There's one guy that uh, 
he told me a story, and I won't say what his name was, Andy Walgren. And him and Sarah, out of the goodness of their heart, felt called to be foster parents for a little while. They, were, uh, they got this little baby that they were being foster parent of, just loved on this little boy. But what they also did was, through that, began to develop relationship with this little boy's parents. And so, just a couple months ago, Andy got a call from the dad of this little boy. And then they, they got the son back, which is a great story. And he says, my truck broke down above parachute, and I was wondering if you could come help me. See, Andy is the guy, I've told him this. If, if the rapture happens post-tribulation, dude, I'm coming after you. Because you can make and build and fix anything. And I know we'll just find the cave and we'll take our two families and we'll survive the seven years. That's the way this dude is. He's so smart and talented. So what did he do? He didn't say, well, let me pray about it. I'll get back with you next week. He said, sure, I'll be right there. He dropped what he was doing. He loaded up his trailer. He drove up above parachute loaded the truck on the, the trailer, drove him back down, and during that drive was just sharing the love of Christ with the man. But why did he do that? It's because the love of God is in him. And he just responded in that. And I believe that man saw Jesus through Andy. That's what he calls us to be as the church, is walking Jesus's. Rebecca Pippin used to say that you be the skin of Jesus. Because there's power of God's love. Great power to change lives. And he says, by this, in verse 17, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. See, that's what love does. It takes away the fear, our existential fear, of what happens when this is all gone. And I just got to let you know, there is going to come a day for everyone in this room. The good news for you is you're going to die. But it's because his kingdom comes in glory and fullness when he takes us home. Home. That is our faith. And he said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You don't know my brother. Right? How do we love the unlovely? How do we love those that have abused us, that have hurt us, that have lied to us, that have deceived us? We can't until we experience his love for us. And then he says, love your neighbor. Love your brother. Forgive him. And he says, in this commandment we have from him, whoever loves... God must also love his brother. See, we don't have to be best chumps. We don't have to hang out all the time, but we have to forgive them, and we have to speak blessing over them. That's what motivated Jesus to come to the cross. Like I said, I'm very insecure. I have to ask Jane every day, do you still love me? But the more I know God's love for me, the more I'm able to love others and the more I see God's love being passed back to me. That there is this synergistic thing that happens through God's love that we experience his love for us, we give it away, and God gives it back to us, and he multiplies it. That's life in the kingdom. That's life the abundant life that God calls us to. And through that, all fear washes away. 
that no matter what age we are, we don't have to fear life after this because we know that we know where we're going because of what he did for us. And he proved his power to overcome the penalty of sin and death through his resurrection. And we will have a resurrected body as well. And so the benefit of knowing and experiencing God's love, and I invite the ministry, the worship team up, please, is true hope comes through faith in what Jesus did for us. And what true hope is, is not, I'm going to go buy the Powerball ticket, and I have hope that God is going to give me a winning number. That's, that's not the hope he's talking about. The hope he's talking about is, is this life, yes, will come to an end. But we have the future hope of eternity in the kingdom of heaven. I hope you look forward to that because it's nothing compared to this. One of the things that is one of the downfalls of us in the West is we have it too good. It's too comfortable here. But when we realize where we're going, faith comes alive. And faith is a response to God's love because he loved us first, because he initiated, because he came, because he gave his life on the cross for us, because he was buried and risen three days later. That is where we find true faith in knowing that he overcame death and the penalty of sin. And the third thing is God's love leads us to love one another. We can't experience the fullness of God's love until we are in relationship with our brothers and sisters. And so let's stand as we respond today to God's love in worship of him and receiving of his love in our hearts that will multiply and pour out into love for one another.